Hello and welcome. My name is Amanda Granger. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the WNET Group, home of Channel 13, America's flagship PBS station in New York City. On behalf of everyone at the WNET Group, I wanna thank you for joining us for the second night of Sometimes We Must Interfere, Conversations on Confronting Inhumanity. Please join us here tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern for our closing night forum, The Border Between Then and Now, a conversation with people threatened with deportation. Sometimes We Must Interfere is held in support of the U.S. and the Holocaust, a new three-part, six-hour series directed and produced by Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein that explores America's response to one of the greatest humanitarian crises of the 20th century. Watch the film and learn more at pbs.org slash holocaust or on the PBS app. Tonight's program, No Longer Unimaginable, A Conversation with Holocaust Survivors, is presented by the WNET Group and the station's Exploring Hate Initiative. Designed to investigate the roots and rise of hate in this country and around the world, Exploring Hate, Anti-Semitism, Racism, and Extremism covers the urgent issues we are grappling with today and examines how we got here. Its stories, programs, and series appear on all of WNET's local and national broadcasts and across our digital platforms. You can learn more at pbs.org slash exploring hate. Part of the WNET's group, group's mission is to provide meaningful experiences to our audiences and communities to educate, entertain, and inspire. By bringing together frontline thought leaders to discuss complex topics of history and the present day, we hope sometimes we must interfere will provide information and ideas that will be helpful to us all. We will have time for an audience Q&A toward the end, so as you watch the live stream, please post your questions in the comments section. I'd like to take a moment to thank our promotional partners for Sometimes We Must Interfere. We are incredibly grateful for the support of Facing History and ourselves, as well as self-help community services. We want to say thank you also to our ASL interpreters for tonight, Rashida Jackson and Wanye Jefferson. And last, a very special thanks to WNET's 400 plus community partners from across sectors and across communities throughout the five boroughs. Their input has shaped and inspired our thinking around this topic and many others. A quick reminder that the views expressed by tonight's guests and attendees are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the WNET group. And now I am pleased to introduce WNET's Director of Community Partnerships and the Curator of Sometimes We Must Interfere, Brian Tate. Thank you so much, Amanda, and greetings, everyone. I wanna begin by paying respect to the Lenape people upon whose unceded and ancestral homeland lies the city we call Manhattan. Please join me in making this affirmation from a place of humility and solidarity with an ongoing commitment to decolonization and racial justice. I want to also acknowledge the continuity between our being here today and the many people who have come before us who directly or indirectly contributed to the fight against fascism, racism, and hate. We, we honor their lives. We are grateful for them. And, and we honor them when we gather across communities to speak truth and create change. I now wanna invite you all to the second night of uh, Sometimes We Must Interfere, Conversations on Confronting Inhumanity. When we hold these town halls, we always start with a uh, brief performance by a gifted musician or spoken word artist to help gather us across this virtual space and also uh, to remind us why we have these tough conversations. And the reason is for the culture. So I'm very excited to welcome tonight uh, a very dear friend um, and also a talented um, uh, singer, producer, composer, and educator, Morley. And accompanying Morley tonight is multi-instrumentalist Chris Bruce. Morley and Chris, it's wonderful to see you both. Great to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes. Uh, Morley, uh, where are you all right now? 
We're in Manhattan. We are in New York City in our oh, apartment. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And what can you tell us about what you will be performing tonight? Now, this is a song called Follow the Sound, and it's part of a compilation called Borderless Lullabies, which is a, um, a, a gathering of poems, spoken word, and songs benefit compilation for KIND, Kids in Need of Defense, which is a pro bono legal defense fund that aids uh, immigrant and refugee children worldwide. And all the proceeds go to this organizations from the from, from to this organization from the recordings. It's called Borderless Lullabies, and it's only available on Bandcamp. And this song is called Follow the Sound. Wonderful. We can't wait to hear it. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Audience, we give you Morley with Chris Bruce. Mama, you said if I ever got lost in a crowd Follow your voice and I, I will be found I don't know what happened, don't know where I am Don't know where you are, so I begin to follow, follow the sign Closing my eyes, now I can fly High above mountains into the sky To follow, follow the sound Follow, follow the sound Bright yellow bird opens her wings I hear your voice it's your song she sings, so I follow, follow the sound, follow, follow the sound. Higher and higher, the moon is so round, you are the blue long thundercloud, I follow, follow the sound. Thank you so much, Morley and Chris. Wow. I feel like we could actually, under other circumstances, would love to hear more of that music. <laughs> uh, I want to encourage everyone uh, watching, if you uh, loved what Morley and Chris just presented as much as we did, please go to the website, uh, morleymusic.org, 
to discover more of that uh, uh, incredible sound. Thank you so much, Morley. Thank you so much, Chris. Bless Thank you. you. Uh, all right. So here we are, uh, day two of um, Sometimes We Must inter Interfere, conversations on confronting inhumanity. Uh, without much further ado, I would like to ask you all to join me now, please, in welcoming tonight's incredible panel. Uh, and the panel tonight is called No Longer Unimaginable, Unimaginable, a Conversation with Holocaust Survivors. You can find everyone's full bios uh, on the event page for tonight at pbs.org slash exploring hate. And that link should also be in the chats at YouTube and on Facebook. Remember also that the panel would like to hear from you as well. So please post your questions in that same chat and we'll get them and, uh, and your questions will be asked uh, later in the program. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Rabbi Shai Held, President and Dean of Hadar. Shai, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much, Brian. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, and our panelists, Michael Bornstein. Mike, we're delighted. You're on mute, Mike. If you could unmute, that would be wonderful. Perfect. Okay. Great to see you, Mike. Uh, Rab Rabbinic Pastor, Dr. Eliza Erber. Eliza, my friend, it's always a joy. Hi. Thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sonia Geismar. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. We're honored and delighted to have you here, Sonia. And last but not least, Elsa Melamid. Elsa, it's great to see you. It's a privilege to speak to so many uh, people, citizens, and friends of WRMU. I'm going to I'm going to cheat things a little bit and just let the audience know, Shai. Uh, what I've had a chance to share with you and Mike is that um, Sonia and Elsa and Eliza and I, uh, uh, we held a conversation about four or five years ago now uh, around similar topics. So um, it is, of course, wonderful to meet Mike, Shai. It's always great to see you. But I just want to say, Elsa, Sonia, and Eliza, it's such a delight to be back in your company. Same um, here. With that, I now, Shai, turn this over to you. Uh, you all have a great conversation. And people watching, remember to put your questions in the chat. Uh, Shai, uh, I'll see you again in about uh, 50 or 60 minutes. Thank you so much, Brian. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. To our panelists, I have a number of questions for you about your thinking about the Holocaust and its relevance to the world today. But before we go there, I wonder if we could open up some windows some brief windows on your own personal experiences um, that led you to be who you are. So we'll start with Eliza and Sonia. Is there a particular memory from your childhood that has stayed with you and helped shape the person that you've become? Eliza, would you be willing to start us off? Sure. Um, I think I was a little bit uh, more fortunate than some of the other people because I was born in 19... 43. So um, there were only two more years left for the war. So for those two years, I was put into an underground bunker that um, had no windows, no doors, and uh, the air was uh, piped in through the sides. And of course, it was covered by a grassy roof. And uh, I stayed there for almost two years. Uh, Often I wonder what happened to the other babies that were there, whether they um, survived the starvation that we went through or the emotional life that follows such a, an isolation. And uh, my mom tells me that uh, when she came to get me, which they had to sneak into the uh, part of Holland that was not liberated as yet, uh, I, I screamed bloody murder because I didn't know who this woman was. And we ended up 
in Israel with more war and more trauma. So that's pretty much my uh, background. So I do want to repeat that I'm more fortunate, even though I have uh, memories and I have body memory. It's hard to explain that. And I grew up with a Holocaust survivor who was extremely traumatized herself. Um, in many ways, I was more fortunate. Thank you so much. Uh, Sonia. I remember Kristallnacht vividly because the Nazis came into our house and destroyed a lot of the, the furniture, the, the uh, dishes, etc. But the worst part for me was seeing a photo of my father that had been taken down, thrown down from, from the wall and the photo uh, was torn up. And as a three and a half year old, I thought that he had died. I knew that he was taken away in the morning to go to, to Dachau. And, and uh, Chris Alnacht has never left me. The other event was being on the St. Louis. I think you all know the story of the St. Louis, so I'm not going to go into it. But my luck, my family was very fortunate in being assigned to England, where we spent uh, eight months. We lived in a boarding house run by a Quaker family, and my mother became the chef, so to speak, for the boarders. And we lived during uh, some, some of the uh, air raids. And I think the other, and we came to the United States in uh, February 1940. The other event that has impacted me is the fact that my maternal grandparents were eventually sent to Auschwitz because in the province they lived in Germany, the province of Baden, all the Jews were rounded up in 1940 and sent westward, not eastward, by the administrator of the state and sent to a relatively unknown camp called detention camp called Gers, at the foothills of the uh, Pyrenees Mountains. Conditions were horrible. And despite the efforts of my mother and her siblings to send them money to get the visa, et cetera, et cetera, there were delays constantly, which I'll go into, I hope, later on with as a result of the um, policies of the State Department. And there was despair and there was hope. And then there was hope and despair. And that is how many of the people there lived in Gurs, only to most of them were sent eventually to Auschwitz. And that is what has been on my mind, all those things. Thank you. Thank you. Ilsa and Mike, I wonder if I could turn to you and ask, was there a person or event from your childhood that has stayed with you and helped define the person that you are today? Ilsa, would you be willing to start? Well, I've been giving this some thought and I really think that my father's instructions to me on the eve of his escape from Dachau to Italy um, uh, has shaped, you know, my path in that. Um, he trusted me to create a pathway for myself 
and to follow it and to be diligent. And I think it kind of uh, describes my personality. Um, how, you know, I internalized it. That, um, I had the same experience of, of being uh, shocked um, when the Nazis came into Vienna. And I can still hear their hoots on the street as they march past, a kind of threatening um, noise. And the, um, uh, the most sort of shocking experience for a child who goes to school is to suddenly find that she doesn't mean anything to anybody at the school and is not wanted there. And so overnight, uh, I was evicted from my school. Um, and somehow, um, reflecting on that, you wonder, you know, what led up to that? How did all those people already have the idea to get rid of the Jews? Uh, when um, the Nazis had not yet arrived. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Mike, you're yeah. muted. Okay, let me unmute. Hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was born in a town called Jarki, Poland and it's near Krakow, you might have heard of that, and another town called Częstochowa. So uh, uh, I was born in May 1940, and uh, Zsarki was an open ghetto. And But the people that uh, have helped me in my life uh, was my mother to a large extent, uh, and my grandmother, Dora. So uh, after uh, Zsarki, uh, we went to a labor camp called Pionki, and uh, conditions uh, were better in, compared to Auschwitz, where I went later on. And uh, uh, basically, we could live. People worked like uh, 12, 15-hour days but at least they, uh, they had a life. Uh, after that, uh, the Nazis made Pionki uterine, which means clean of Jews. And uh, uh, my mother, my father, my older brother, and my grandmother, Dora, uh, were moved to, uh, to Auschwitz. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Auschwitz. And we went into a cattle car. Uh, we were herded in there, could hardly have any room to breathe. Uh, one of my grandparents actually were killed, suffocated in one of those rides to a concentration camp. So there, uh, my mother, my grandmother and I were separated to the women's side my father and my brother went to the men's side. Uh, I went to a children's book. My mother actually probably uh, saved my life by coming into the children's book. She showed me how she was beaten over the head to share some of the bread with me. And then eventually she was concerned I wouldn't survive. Uh, the older kids were starving too. And she moved me to the women's bunk and uh, what I'm told, I was a good hider. I hid under straw. Uh, but uh, things that I remember is uh, uh, basically Nazis shouting at me in German. Uh, I re remember uh, my grandmother and I going into garbage cans to find moldy potato skins to eat. And uh, those are some of the things I remember. Eventually, my mother was moved uh, to Austria 
to a labor camp to pack bullets. And my grandmother, Dora, uh, was there to uh, hide me. And uh, eventually the Nazis were losing the war. Uh, they had a death march. My grandmother, by accident, took me to, quote, unquote, infirmary. And uh, uh, that was one of the miracles that saved our lives because uh, uh, I, we would have never, never survived the death march. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. And, and thank you all. I think one of the things that may not be obvious to you is just how palpable and powerful your stories are to this day. Um, so I thank you for your candor. Um, I want to ask you now if I can shift gears for a minute. Um, before the Holocaust happened, many people obviously could not imagine it happening. And even once the horror became clear, there were people who said, it's incomprehensible and so it just can't be. Today in America, we see a rise in unrestrained attacks against communities that are labeled as different and for that matter, against the very foundations of our democracy. And just as then, we also see really insistent denial that these phenomena are real. Sonia and Elise, I wanna to turn to you if I could and ask, do we have a historical responsibility to imagine the danger that could come, to imagine the worst case scenarios? And how do we do that? when powerful people tell us that we're delusional, that we're imagining things. When the alarm bells first go off, is there a balance we should strike between imagining, acting, allowing space for uncertainty? How do we live through a moment like this? Sonia, would you start us off? There are dangers all around us of of hate and bigotry and anti-Semitism and racism. And unless there is a concerted effort by all of us to combat this, it will continue. Just as, as it has grown, it's dis very disturbing to see what is happening in our country. And the only way to combat this is with leadership from groups that stand for justice and humanity. Because hatred is a societal issue. It's not a personal issue. And hatred is learned and can be unlearned. So you have to start with education, but that doesn't take care of the adults. They're not in school. So community groups can bring together people of different nationalities, different religions, different cultures. There has to be contact among different groups of people so that the fear of quote the other is just dissipates over time and unless we really grab a hold of the dangers that are in our society it's going to be a very difficult future for us Aliza, yeah, I'd like to say, yeah, I'd like to say that Sonia uh, absolutely said it beautifully. Um, I, I, there's not much that I can add to what she has said. However, on a personal level, uh, I find myself being afraid. And I'm not the only one. I, I speak with my American friends who are Jewish. And they are also seeing what's going on and they're afraid of uh, what's going on in our country today. And they're afraid that it's going to escalate and uh, get worse. So 
I am also would like to include uh, uh, the Ukraine because all I can think of is the children over there right now who are going through what I went through and the isolation for two years, which is still impacting my life today. So I think that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Um, Sonia, you mentioned education. And so I want to turn to education for a minute. We see in this country a growing number of cases where officials insist that history that upsets the dominant narrative shouldn't be taught. I have the impression sometimes that we have an attempt educationally, at least among some, to stamp out empathy rather than cultivating it, right? To ban books that upset the dominant narratives. So I, I want to turn now to Mike and Ilsa and say, how do you hope or wish that the Shoah were discussed today? What lessons of history are to your mind the most important ones for Americans, whether they are fourth graders or whether they are elected officials to understand and internalize? So Mike, why don't we start with you? Okay, I completely agree with you that education is key. Uh, and, uh, Besides education, I, I think uh, something my mother gave me, which has a Hebrew inscription, a Gimel and a Zion. It's, I don't know if I can uh, point that to you, but it, it's a watch with uh, the inscription Gimel and Zion. It stands for Gamze Ya'avor, which means this too shall pass. So in addition to education, be optimistic, uh, look forward to the future. I know we have a lot of discrimination against people of color, Asian people, uh, Hispanics, LGBT community, and we need to uh, work with them and support them. Uh, education, education, education. Thank you. Um, Ilsa, would you wanna to add to that? Well, I think um, I, I agree that uh, that uh, social uh, factors uh, are essential ways of um, of forming attitudes and values, and um, um, I'm, I'm thinking back to the social situations that were present at the time when uh, my father was arrested and my mother uh, tried hard to bring my sister and myself to safety. And I had the opportunity of traveling on a kinder transport. And a, a great deal of the good work that was done for the kinder transport was done by Quakers. And of course, there were also Jewish people. But uh, the Quakers, with their uh, way of um, relating uh, in a, as a group, I think um, had a, a special um, um, view uh, and um, I think it um, it was reflected in their actions. Um, I don't know that education, uh, you know, a lesson has enough effect. I think people have to see an, the, an individual and face to face. And um we're not terribly good at um, taking things in in the crowd the crowd often misleads us thank you um but before we go on i just want to take a minute to remind our viewers that we want to hear your questions too so please drop them in the chat 
wherever you're watching and we'll get to them during the Q&A. Eliza, it looks like you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I would like to add something that we are living in a time today where we have precedence, where we have had a global event that was so traumatic uh, to everyone. I never met my father, but my father was 32 when he died at Auschwitz. Uh, he was an optimistic, uh, educated, sports person, and he happened to have been blonde and had green eyes. So not your typical Hitler's view of uh, the Jew. Um, so I, I would just like to say that we need to capitalize on the fact that we do have history and we do have um, something to, to teach uh, our children. I also teach university, and I'm shocked that most of my uh, college students have never heard of the Holocaust. They have no idea. They don't know what Auschwitz was. And they're 18, 19, and 20 years old. So obviously, our education is not going far enough. Um, when I found out about my father, uh, that just added trauma on top of trauma. And um, I went to Holland. I was in Holland uh, last month, and they have erected a new wall called the uh, um, names um, names. Uh, what is that? The names wall. The names um, uh, monuments, and uh, on each brick there is uh, a name of a person who did not return to Holland. And out of 130. Uh, Jews in Holland, 106 or 107 did not return. And uh, on that wall were nine members of my own family, including my father, including my great grandmother, who was a Hungarian Christian Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic, who happened to have been married to a Jew. Uh, and there he was, and there with all of them. So We need to we need to do a better job educating. I know we do it in the Hebrew schools. I know we do it in the synagogues. I've written a play about it that's about to circulate. Um, it's just that I don't know how to go at how to go more about what I can do, but I think people in administration uh, can possibly bring in more programs like that that educate both the young and the old. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me shift gears for a minute and, and share with you very briefly um, a conversation I had a few years ago that has really stayed with me. My parents were European refugees and a, um, a close friend of mine said to me a couple of weeks before the presidential election in 2016, his, his grandparents were survivors. And he said to me something that I, I really, I, I can't tell you how often I think about this. He said, shy. If you've ever wondered who among the people we know would have saved my grandparents, now is the moment when we're finding out. I, I want to ask um, Aliza and Ilsa, if I could, what do you think separates the person who would, sep who would risk their own safety to save strangers from those who would stand by and do nothing? Well, I don't know that I'm exactly answering your question, but um, um, I, um, before I came to live in the United States, I lived in Australia. And, you know, that's going back to the six, late 60s. And I lived there for 14 years. And those were different times. And maybe society was different at that time. But there was a very close connection between one person and the next. Just to give you a humorous example, um, if you went into a taxi, you better not sit in the back seat because the driver would say to your soulmate, you know, you can't come and sit next to me, <laughs> which, um, you know, reflected their attitude that we're all alike. And um, it was a less uh, struck society, certainly, in uh, Great Britain. Um, and um, now I've lost my train of thought. 
but anyway, I think that, um, oh yes. So having come from that background and walking along uh, one of the West streets in West Village in New York, I saw a man on the ground. And as an Australian, the first thing you would do is to go up to that person and say, can I help you? Um, and that experience uh, at that time uh, didn't lead to any difficult consequences. But um, sometime later, I saw a woman who was having trouble keeping her balance on the street and clutching onto uh, a lamppost. And again, I approached her and asked her if I could help her. And then I learned how difficult it is in this society uh, where um, the deeds of, of people and the disconnection between people is much more marked. And, um, and I can't imagine taking such actions now. Uh, it would seem quite bizarre. It's really, um, uh, Shai, it's, it's really an amazing question because I know that today, uh, even I, I ask myself sometimes if I were put in the situation of the people who saved me and uh, other members of my family, uh, would I have had the courage to do the same thing? And it was amazing courage because if you were found you were dead there was absolutely no question about it uh in in my case the underground network in holland had uh dug a this bunker that i was put into for two years um and there was a, a righteous a gentile christian man who uh was a physician and he's the one who sort of cared for 10 of us under there uh, and uh, we really don't know what happened to him. Uh, the last I knew, but I have no verification, was that he was caught and uh, gave his life up. Didn't give, was taken. So it is what makes a, a person do such a heroic act is something on the inside of that person, the strength that they have, the belief that wrong is wrong and right is right and that you do what is supposed to be done uh, when other people will. The quote we have here from Ellie Wiesel, sometimes you have to interfere, um, that answers that question. You know, listening to you, Ilsa and Aliza, the, the, the thing that, I, and I, I see their hands, so let me just, maybe sort of get this out and then we'll take um, more comments. The thing that strikes me listening to you is it seems to me that one of the great problems in our society is that we lack a sense of social solidarity, let alone of human solidarity. And I guess I want to ask you from your own wisdom and your own experience, is that fixable? And if so, how do we fix it? How do we raise children who feel like people who are other than they in every way are their responsibility. How do we do that? Mike, would you like to go first? If you feel you have a response to that? Okay. Uh, let me just make a comment uh, about helping others. Uh, I think I mentioned to you that uh, uh, my father was president of the Judenrat. And this is in our town where I was born in Jarki. There was uh, Marvin Zborowski, he and his brother started the International Society of Yad Vashem. And uh, Marvin tells the story about uh, he was on a work detail. One day, he probably had a fever. He couldn't get up to go to work. Nazis came in, put a pillow over his head, and uh, took him to jail. And the sentence, the sentence for not going to work was death. My father came in, he bribed the Nazi and saved Marvin's life. 
So I feel that is really important to uh, other people, I'm sure, have done similar things. So maybe go back to the question. Could you repeat the question that you had? Yeah, I, 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 I'm interested in how you think we can go about, actually, I should say whether you think we can go about, and if so, how you think we can go about instilling a sense of social solidarity in this country, a sense that we are all responsible for one another. How do we do that? Well, how do we fix that lack? Well, again, I think colleges and high schools and other schools need to teach about what happened to the Holocaust and how we can do, again, we're back to education, how, what we can do to educate people that uh, uh, if, if you don't stand up and work with your fellow mates, you know, things will get worse. And uh, we, my daughter and I uh, wrote Survivors Club. I don't know if you've read it. Uh, my daughter, Debbie, is a wonderful writer. And uh, uh, again, talking about education, going, we go to schools, we teach kids, because kids learn what their parents teach them. And uh, if you can teach their parents and teach the kids to be kind, to be considerate, and uh, look out for your fellow mates, I think it would go a long way. I think it goes a little bit beyond teaching also. I'm sorry, uh, Sonia. Uh, the Israelis and the Palestinian uh, have a, a teenage um, program where they uh, bring to the United States, they bring Israeli kids and Palestinian kids. And the common bond that these children have is soccer. So it's a soccer camp, but they bond really bond for the for the month or so that they are here and that's one way for to teach children that look this is a different person but he's not the other he's exactly like you if he falls he scrapes his knee and it bleeds um well my daughter who's a, a shakespeare scholar uh <laughs> will verify shylock's uh, words on that but I, I think it goes even beyond uh, the education. Uh, I, I've been teaching Hebrew school forever, and I've been teaching college forever, and, and uh, I, I've been a rabbinic pastor in a synagogue uh, trying to, to teach and educate. And just talking is, by a survivor, I find is effective because people uh, connect emotionally. But when you're talking to a seventh grader, uh, which I do a lot in, in, in regular schools, it's not the same because they are children and children need to have something that they are passionate about. And what they're passionate about is either sports or something like that. And if you can cause events where you bring the other with the other and give them a venue like that, I think that'll be a more effective uh, way not to not to put out education for adults and, and, and colleges and all of that that's more intellectual but I think on a, on a younger level it needs to be a little bit more um, passionate for them Sonia you wanted to get in here yes I think a lot of this has to do with the home life of children and being taught what is good and to be good and to be considerate. I don't know how you get that moral responsibility, but that's really what it comes down to for people who risk their lives for others who are willing to do that. And actually there are so many unsung heroes during the Holocaust who did just that. They spoke out, they formed organizations, they helped others. And where that comes from, it has to come from within because one person can make a difference. Just like with Gustav Schroeder, the captain of the St. Louis, uh, 
um, the uh, so many others I, I could enumerate and go on and on. But somehow these people stood up to the plate on the plate. Thank you. So let me, if 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 I could, shift us to being more explicit about contemporary America, because on the one hand, all historical experiences are unique, and we should avoid facile comparisons. On the other hand, we would be foolish to dismiss historical resonances between past events and present day realities. So Ilsa, I want to start with you. Are, are, are there aspects of the present moment that remind you of what you experienced or learned about the Holocaust? Do you hear alarm bells ringing in our society today that we should all stop and heed? And if so, what are they? Um, well, uh, some of the bells that have been ringing lately are really quite um, uh, hopeful. Uh, I'm thinking of how people received the Ukrainians which fled their country uh, and they were received by people who had a reputation for being rather uh, hostile to Jews. So there's a very hopeful sign there. Um, um, I do did want to tell you that um, uh, those people like myself who were transported uh, out of Germany and Austria mostly, and uh, through an organization which is now known as the Kinder Transport. And that is often very well received uh, when you talk to people. Somehow the fact that it has to do with Kinder and people do know what a kindergarten is. Uh, it, um, it's a um, image that uh, receives, uh, that is m more easily digested. Um, and, and we, who are members of that organization, uh, reach out uh, through the internet and speaking to children. And I think uh, these talks uh, to children by people who have um, can relate their own childhood experiences, they are very meaningful. Uh, thank you. Um, Sonia, I wonder if I could turn to you and ask you about the alarm bells that you hear right now. What keeps you up at night about this country? Uh, the divisiveness and the unwillingness of people to speak, so to speak to each other, to exchange ideas, and the intransigence of some who will not listen to the truth. And this is tearing our country apart. Plus, the idea of strong leadership not allegiance to one person, but allegiance to ideas and ideals and goals to improve life for everyone in this country. And I just hope that that will happen, that we're turning a corner and becoming more united. You know, it's, it's interesting. I. I heard President Biden say just the other day, um, I want to share this, this quote with you. President Biden said, in America, evil will not win, will not prevail, and white supremacists will not have the last word. Mike and Eliza, I want to ask you, Mike, you talked before explicitly about optimism. Do you share President Biden's optimism and why or why not? Well, I do. This is Mike again. Uh, I do share President Biden's optimism, but, but 
we have neo-Nazis marching, we have white supremacists marching, we have Asians being beaten in subways in New York City and other places, and certainly we have Ukrainians that we care about a lot, where they're separated from their kids, uh, just like uh, the Nazis did. So uh, uh, I I think uh, we should look forward to the future, be optimistic, but we do have to see all the hate, all the hate that's going on in the United States. Again, not just Jewish people, Asians, Hispanics, uh, people of color, LGBT, and uh, we need to stand up and educate people. Again, I keep bringing up education, but I think it's critical. Uh, my daughter is actually running for uh, uh, school board of education, and I hope she wins because I think that is critical uh, for our society. Aliza? Aliza, oh, you're on mute. 10,000 children. Am I muted? No, you're good now. You're good. Okay. Uh, this is called 10,000 Children, and it is a book about the survivors of the uh, uh, kinder transport. Uh, and I use that to teach the Holocaust to sixth graders, um, probably to show them that there is optimism and that people are can be good and that uh, people survive. But I want to bring an example uh, right now uh, to the question that you asked me, I live in a big building in Riverdale, New York, which is the Bronx. And about four or five months ago, there were, uh, almost every corner has a synagogue where I live. And uh, at that time, I, every time I walked my dog, uh, I saw police cars with the lights, you know, so I finally stopped to ask what's going on. And they said, well, this, uh, this uh, man in his 20s stopped by almost every synagogue in, in the surrounding area and smashed the windows. Talk about Kristallnacht. And uh, it turned out, and I was absolutely shaken up. Uh, I walked my dog at night as well. And it turned out that he lives in my section of my building on the fourth floor. I'm on the 12th floor. And there he is, and they cannot get him out. Whatever law laws those are, they cannot get him out. They have they they are surveilling him, but so far he's still here. So talk about fear. I know that education is of paramount importance, and that's what I do. I educate. Um, I talk. I give talks, like everyone else on the panel, by the way, uh, gives gives talks to school kids and, and adults. But I'm still afraid. I'm still afraid. Thank you. Thank you for your, you know, uh, your, your bluntness and your candor. I, I, in light of that, and in light of what Mike said, I want to talk about Charlottesville for a minute. Because I think many of us would say we could never have imagined in 2017 in America seeing a bunch of white supremacists marching without shame out in the open, declaring Jews will not replace us. Right. Um, I want to ask you, what do you think led us there? How did America end up, as it were, in Charlottesville? And what can we do to make sure that that is a blight on our story rather than an increasingly common experience. Sonia and Ilsa, why don't we why don't we why don't we ask you, Sonia, why don't you go first if you're willing? And then Ilsa you can you can you can add. Uh, Charlottesville was shocking. And I, I I can't say anything more about it that this happened, but it shows that there are groups in the country that will organize and do everything to uh, spread their vicious ideas and demonstrate. And we have to somehow decompress these people to 
I have how to do this, I don't know. But this is just hopeful thinking to uh, prevent the spread of these ideas. Well, um, I think that um, one should make some attempt to talk to individuals, even in such a hostile group, um, and um, find some common ground. Um, uh, you know, people are not born with these uh, attitudes. They are developed. And I think um, if one uh, probes uh, their, you know, uh, underlying reasons why people seek membership in, in these hostile groups. Um, I just go up to them and tell them I don't want to be like them. <laughs> I want to be better than them. Let me um let, let, let me ask this if you since we're, we're we're talking about Charlottesville, I want to talk for a minute in a related vein about America's family separation policy um, mm. in during, under the Trump administration. And I want to ask um, if I could, if if you'll forgive me, I want to ask you very personally what it felt like for you, given some of the stories that you've shared about your own childhoods to see your own country doing that. Again, I'm not, I don't want to make comparisons that are too facile or that are unwarranted, but what does it feel like for a child who's been separated from their family? At least I'm thinking, for example, about what you talked about, to see children ripped from their mother's arms. Do you, do you want to start, Elisa, and then maybe Mike? Yes, I, I definitely do. I was in Washington at the rally um, in front of the White House about the uh, separated uh, children. And I was fortunate en enough to be asked to speak uh, about what it felt like to be separated. As I said, I was seven or eight months old when I was taken away from my mother, put in an underground bunker without heat, which was moist, without windows, without doors, um, isolated, without food, I don't even know if I had a diaper. And I want to tell everybody that this, this stayed with me my whole life, whether consciously or subconsciously, or I, 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 <laughs> I, I know that in some ways I'm different from other people who have not experienced uh, two years of traumatic separation from their parent. Uh, it translated to my parenting to my children. It was very difficult. And I, I was so upset, and I still am so upset, that these children that were taken away at, at the border and put into cages uh, without their parents, it's not going to go away. I'm 79 years old. I'll be 80 on my next birthday. It's not going to go away. It's going to be there always for these children. So they have gone through traumatic separation through no ill doing of themselves, or not doing anything, but because someone in the White House has built it. Outrageous. Thank you. Um, Mike? Uh, well, I think about a story, my cousin, Ruth, uh, she uh, uh, and a number of people, including Zborowski's and her parents were in a uh, bunker, but Ruth was like three years old and the people that owned the house said, we'll take you, but we can't have Ruth because if she cries, uh, and the Nazis come in, we'll all be killed. So Ruth was put into a cloister in Chemstochowa, and uh, uh, the nuns cared for her. And when her parents came, they she said, no, you're not my parents. But uh, my, uh, my aunt uh, had 
a cloth, her, part of her dress, and she taught her the alphabet. And so finally, when she was singing the alphabet, my uh, cousin realized she wasn't an orphan anymore. And, uh, but that really affected her throughout her life. And uh, it has an impact if you're separated from your parents. And uh, you need something to hang on to. And the safest thing is your, uh, uh, to survival are your parents who care for you. Thank you. Um, it distresses me a lot when uh, uh, policies and uh, administration uh, take an action to um, uh, make potential good citizens into a hostile um, group. Uh, I mean, it's uh, not uh, very wise. Uh, it would be much better if we went out of our way uh, to befriend the people and give them the opportunity of being cooperative citizens in our society. Uh, of course, that also means that they should be taught the language so that they can communicate and understand what is going on. But to keep people isolated and show them nothing but hostility uh, will turn out badly for us. Um, I, I want to ask you, I, as I've been listening to you, I've heard several of you talk about the importance of hope. And then, Aliza, I heard you use the word outrageous a minute ago. So I want to I want to ask you, of all things, about a debate among contemporary moral philosophers. Moral philosophers argue vehemently about the moral significance of anger. Some philosophers, like Martha Nussbaum, argue that anger is basically always toxic, an emotion that we should seek to overcome. But other philosophers, like Maisha Cherry, insist that righteous anger is crucial in the struggle for a more just society. And actually that anger can help the oppressed and downtrodden maintain their own dignity. So I wanna ask you, when you look at this moment, when you experience this moment in America, do you think anger serves a purpose in our struggle with hatred and extremism? Let's, let's, let's turn that question to Ilsa and, and Sonia, if we could. Well, it brings to mind all those people who uh, keep uh, weapons in their households and are um, determined uh, to defend themselves because they see uh, the other, the stranger, you know, as a danger to themselves. Um, it's, it's it's kind of incredible to me that um, that there are so many people uh, who carry weapons, um, anticipating hostility. Thank you, Sonia. I guess righteous anger has a place in in motivating people to fight for a cause. I'm thinking particularly of the uh, civil rights movement. Without anger as to their, the, the way uh, blacks were treated in this country, you couldn't have a, a civil rights movement. However, that may that is perhaps what motivated people, but the they had ideals to implement what they what the movement was about. 
So it may be the underlying cause for starting a movement or a group, etc. But it has to be overlaid with a a a, uh, a program, a uh, set of ideas and statements that are more gentle. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I want to just before we turn in a moment to um, to the Q and A, um, just give you each literally thirty seconds, which I know is unfair. To, to answer the question, if you could, what do you think ought to be the very first step people watching should take to help ensure that the horrors of the Holocaust remain relegated to history? Elisa, would you start? Oh, can you come back to me? <laughs> sure. Um, I need to Mike, think about that. Start? I need to think about that. Well, I... There is a difference uh, between Nazis and German people as one example. And we need to differentiate uh, between groups. Uh, I'll give you an example. I received my PhD from the University of Iowa and my roommate uh, is German. And uh, uh, we did a lot of things together. He introduced me to my wife in the Hillel group. And uh, uh, he eventually became best man in uh, our wedding. So I, I think you have to uh, differentiate between different groups, even though they might be German, they might be, uh, uh, hopefully they're not neo-Nazis or white supremacists. Uh, and if they are, you need to try to educate them if it's at all possible. Thank you. Ilsa? Well, I think there should be more openness uh, on the part of uh, people who have been uh, in great danger and uh, aggressed against. And uh, we should hear their stories. And then perhaps um, there would be less inclination to form a gang and um, or uh, unarmed armed forces. I think a lot of uh, good has been done by Holocaust survivors speaking up. Um, there's too much silence on the part of returning servicemen who have been subjected to dehumanizing situations and, um, uh, and the, um, you know, distorted perception of, of themselves and the world uh, is perpetuated. Sonia? If we can think of the, quote, other as a human being and not an enemy and try to embrace them as a human being, we will all be better off. Thank you. Um, Aliza? Exactly what I was going to bring up is the other. People are always afraid of the other. And if you teach early through education that the other isn't an isn't an other but the same uh we might be able to be a more homogeneous um society i i don't think differentiating between groups uh is the way to go even though yes there are good people there are people who belong to this and not all germans were nazis and all of that um nonetheless i think if you teach uh people to be homogeneous and to understand the next person rather than well he's not like me his face is different his color is different blah 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 uh i don't hate him but i don't have to associate with him uh is not the right way to go thank you um 
given the hour is late, given that the hour is late, I want to I want to just take one and perhaps perhaps two questions from a bunch that our viewers have shared with us. Um, I, I want to ask um, if I could. Um, one of our viewers asked about Mike, you talked about the need for um, relationships across communities to respond to racism and hate. For someone who doesn't have friends in other communities, one of our viewers asks, how do I go about doing that? What should be my first step? Mike, do you wanna share some wisdom about that? Well, I think listening to other people and uh, what their thoughts are uh, gets you more idea of what they stand for, what their beliefs are. And then uh, I think that probably would help in, uh, in friendships and knowing what your neighbor is like. And maybe you'll love your neighbor. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it, uh, it's the beginning. Yeah. Does anyone else want to quickly weigh in on that? Okay, so let me let me if I could ask one one last question that came from um, from one of our viewers. Um, one of our viewers writes that his biggest concern is the rising hostilities and hate against Jews, against African Americans, and against other minorities in our country. And he asks, I think you know the obvious and powerful question: How can the diverse peoples in our nation be united? And how can our democracy be protected and defended in the face of all of these hostilities? I'll give you, you know, each a, a, a closing moment to to address th that question. Um, Ilsa, would you be willing to go first? Well, if only I had the answer for such a big question. Right, of course. <laughs> yeah, but there's no doubt that uh, you can um, make a point of reaching out to someone that you see as the other and find out who they really are. And you can do that little exercise and see where it leads you. And if it's successful, then you might try it again. Thank you. Um, Sonia? Uh, I don't have much to add to that, but I agree with what Ilsa said. Thank you. Um, Aliza. Ditto. It's a really big question, and it's not a question that you can answer on regular heart, uh, standing on one foot, so to speak. Uh, this is something that I would actually like to uh, pursue and, and, and see if I can answer it for myself. I don't know except for what we've already said here. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I, I'm told that we have time for one more question. So I wanna ask this one to maybe allow us to begin to wrap up on, um, on a note of hope amidst realism. Um, what stories of triumph or victory have you heard in the last year or a few years that um, you feel our viewers ought to keep in mind as we live through this difficult moment in, um, in American history. What 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 stories ground your sense of hope and possibility? Uh, Sonia, would you be willing to start us off? Uh, I have to think about that. Okay, uh, Mike. Oh, I, um, I see Aliza. You want to go first, Aliza, and then Mike. It, it, it doesn't matter to me. I just got a um, an email from uh, the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center. Uh, they have a twinning program. And uh, there's a young lady who's about to become bat mitzvah in uh, December. And they asked me if I would twin with her. So we're going to meet and talk and, and I'm gonna 
try and, and show her what I've got and, and talk to her. And that gives me hope because this is not something that I'm going somewhere to a large auditorium to speak to a whole bunch of people, which is also great, uh, don't get me wrong. But this is a, a child, a one-on-one -on -one child that I can sit with and have tea with and talk to face-to-face, uh, -to -face, and that gives me hope. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Uh, well, uh, we had a celebration of uh, uh, the uh, uh, 75th anniversary uh, of the liberation of Auschwitz and the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation headed by Ronald Lauder of SD Lauder fame uh, invited uh, over a hundred survivors to Auschwitz, uh, chartered a beautiful plane and uh, we had a dinner. My daughter and I were keynote speakers right after another speaker, which was uh, President uh, Zelensky, the head of uh, Ukraine. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, he is uh, embodying uh, uh, basically courage. Uh, he's actually Jewish, believe it or not. And uh, he embodies, he's not giving up, he's fighting, and hopefully he'll win. But uh, the odds are really great against him, but uh, he's doing a good job. Um, thank you. Uh, Sonia, please. Yes, uh, I belong to an organization called the St. Louis Legacy Project. And we are invited to speak in middle schools, high schools, colleges, community organizations, and whatnot. And the people are willing to listen to what we have to say. They also see a film called Complicit. And the fact that people come away with knowing something that they had never heard of before and become involved is very, very positive to me. Thank you. Ilsa, I'll give you the last word. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, I think you need to reframe the question for me. I, I, I really was asking if there are any victories or triumphs in our yeah. struggle with hatred and racism that give you hope as we go forward. Yeah. Well, I do think that um, the person who came to mind was Zelensky, I think. He's a courageous person. Um, and um, that's one thing. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Mike, Elisa, Ilsa, Sonia, I just really want to thank you both for your thoughtfulness and the heartfulness of your of your candor really really appreciate it and I, I know I speak for our viewers when I when I thank you um, really sincerely um, with that um, I'm gonna bid you a good night and hand it over to Brian Tate who will close us out for the evening thanks Brian thank you so much uh, goodness and panel uh, I, I uh, could have listened for another hour and I don't think that I'm alone in that so much wisdom uh so much heartfelt feeling and testimony you've shared tonight it's a real honor to be in your company and just a joy uh at the same time so thank you um before i do the actual close that i just want to you know uh lisa you mentioned uh the ellie weissel quote that inspired the title for tonight's uh program and uh i think that so many people may know it but I will read it nonetheless, because it really captures the spirit of what we are hoping to address here. And this is a quote uh, uh, that is a part of his uh, speech uh, the Nobel for the, when he received the Nobel Prize. And he said, sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. 
wherever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. And it is in that spirit that we have uh, titled this series of programs, Sometimes You Must Interfere. So delighted to be here with you all tonight on the live stream. Um, and thank you, Morley uh, and Chris Bruce, for that very moving performance at the top. You created just the right atmosphere that we needed to have this talk. I want to say thank you also to our promotional partners, Facing History and Ourselves, and Self-Help Community Services for their support here and the work that they do year-round. Uh, incredible organizations. Please look them up. They're doing vital work. On behalf of everyone here at the WNET group, thank you for watching tonight. And please return tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Eastern, for our closing night event, The Border Between Then and Now, a conversation with people threatened with deportation today. Learn more at pbs.org slash exploring hate. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. We will see you again soon.